Good day, dear student, and welcome to the lecture number eight. Today, we're going to talk with you about waves in the ocean. Now, let's repeat the most important information about properties of waves. So, first thing you have to remember that waves are transmitting the energy. It's not the water mass that's moving, it's just the energy that moves, and you can see that as a crest and trough. If the water particle would move with the same speed as the crest on the surface of the water, then we would have amazingly strong current. Waves are classified by several characteristics, and uh, about this we'll provide you more information in the next slides. The behavior of a wave depends on the relation between the wave size and depth of the water through which it's moving. So this means water, um, the water wave moves differently in different water areas. So let's say if it's a deep water, then water wave will behave differently. If it's a shallow water and the, wa the wave which is approaching from deep water will behave differently on shallow waters. Wind waves form when the energy is transferred from wind to water so which is actually the main source of the wind most of the uh, of the waves most of the waves are formed because of the wind and just a few persons are generated by tsunamis uh, by other ships etc but the main source of energy for waves is wind waves can change direction by refraction and diffraction that's also quite logic so when the wave is approaching narrow channel, it doesn't mean that it will follow the same profile of the narrow channel after it will pass the narrow channel. Yeah, it will spread and also if there will be an obstacle, it will reflect from it and move in different direction. In science, waves are defined as undulatory motion of water surface and we have two main wave categories. The first one is progressive waves, the second one is standing waves. So of course most commonly at sea we see progressive waves, which are surface waves, just regular waves which we see all the time when we sail, uh, internal waves which happening uh, on the picnic line which is uh, on depth of around 100-200 meters, tsunamis and uh, when we're talking about the sachis, sachis are most commonly happening in base uh, lakes, so let's say in closed water reservoirs or partly closed reservoirs. Every wave basically has two most important parts, which is crest and trough. So where the crest is defined as the highest height of the wave and trough is lowest low of the wave. Also, every wave has the following parameters, which is wave height, wave amplitude, wave length, and wave period. By the way, the period is helping us to um, classify different waves. So, let's say how to understand whether it's tsunami or just the chop. Period. We have to count period and with help of period, you will be able to classify what kind of wave you see. Let's have a quick look on the table with different wave names. But be careful, this is idealized table, so those figures might differ in real life. The first thing you have to look for is the generating force. So for those four waves, the most the source of energy that generates those waves is wind. So wind is generating capillary waves, chop waves, swell and side chain. Capillary has the shortest wave period, which is 0.1 second. Chop, one second and more. Swell has period of 30 seconds. So usually what we see in the Atlantic Ocean, from my experience, there is a swell of period of uh, around 10 seconds. And then we have sages, but sages are not that common in oceans or at seas. Most commonly that is happening in bays and lakes. Next two types are tsunamis and tides. You know that the, mess, the, the generating force for tsunami is earthquake and for tides it's an attracting force, attraction force from moon and sun. 
and of course they have the largest period from all of them so for instance tide have period of approximately 12 hours and 24 hours because uh, uh, you can see it from nautical publications that sometimes uh, it's uh, twice a day in the port areas we have peaking level of the sea sometimes it's peaking just one time a day tsunami it's not very common luckily for our planet because tsunami usually bringing a lot of death and uh, they destroying a lot of cities and ports they can have also different period so if the first wave approached the shore and destroyed everything it doesn't mean that uh, being on shore now is safe because usually there is a second and third wave that coming towards the shore of course sometimes they can be weaker but still they possess a lot of danger tsunami can have period of 10 minutes one hour it depending of uh, on the source of the energy so if the earthquake was very strong then of course uh, you have to expect bigger waves and uh, most probably they will have different period but it also dependent on the bottom structure of the area where you expect tsunami so be careful with that from the ruler on the left side you can understand which theoretical maximum possible height can have those waves we see that capillary waves which have the smallest period have also the smallest height so it's just smaller small tiny waves on the surface of the water chop can be a little bit bigger but swell look at the height can be up to 10 meters of course close to swell we have uh, tides yeah, because in some areas on uh, our planet uh, tide can be even 17 meters high yeah but uh, again it's idealized table and all the numbers here are given just approximately we also know that tsunami uh, according to this table can be only 10 meters but actually tsunami can be also higher but with help of this table you can approximately understand how um, different types of waves are distincting from each other differing from each other as it was mentioned in previous slides that the waves mostly the waves are getting generated by the wind and the size and period of the wave depends on the duration of contact with the wind which is quite logic so the stronger is wind yeah, which is wind velocity the more speed it has yeah, the bigger wave it can generate so for instance let's take a wind of 10 knots and 70 knots you can logically understand that 70 knots will have will transmit much more energy to the water surface compared to 10 knots wind duration if the wind is blowing for 24 hours of course it has much more time to share this energy with water surface if the wind duration is just 15 minutes then most probably it will not result in bigger waves that's also quite logical fetch area what is the fetch area basically it's quite simple to understand fetch area is the area of contact between water surface and wind so that's the area where wind is sharing energy with water this means that not all areas on our planet above water surface have wind yeah, so let's say if it's Atlantic Ocean so area just for example area around Bahamas will have strong wind but area close to Azores will have no wind but it doesn't mean that waves will not approach from Bahamas to Azores yeah so that's the fetch area area where the wind blowing on the water surface that's the basically the area where waves are getting generated and the third factor which is uh, impacting size and type of the waves is of course original state of the sea surface this means if the water surface was stable when the wind started blowing on it yeah it will definitely impact the size because if the wind will start blowing on the area which had swell this will result of course in much more efficient energy sharing as wind velocity increases yeah everything will increase basically all the parameters of the waves will grow because they will get more energy the more energy they will get the much bigger they are able to grow in effect uh, state the current state of the sea is telling you a lot about 
the amount of energy that was shared from the wind. A fully developed sea. From this statement, you can understand that sometimes sea can be not fully developed. So what is that? How to understand it? It's actually quite simple. Let's take as an example sea state when it's zero Beaufort scale. Sea surface is just like a mirror, flat, no waves at all. And suddenly we get five knots of wind. Logically, five knots of wind will not be able to generate waves of uh, 10 meters. Yeah, let's say maximum for wind speed of five knots is generation of uh, maybe 20 centimeter waves. It's, again, it's just approximate number. So when wind started blowing, it doesn't mean that 20 centimeter waves will immediately develop. No, it will take some time until the wind will generate those 20 centimeter waves. So this period when wind just started blowing and it's still building those 20 centimeter waves is called as not fully developed sea. But when the wind reached its maximum in developing the sea, then it's called fully developed sea. Of course, if the wind speed will increase, then again, we have some period of not fully developed sea. But again, when the wave height reached its maximum, we can say that it's fully developed sea. Next term is significant wave height. It's especially important when you read the weather forecast. Uh, look, significant wave height is the average of the highest one third. And the key word here is the average. Average is evil in science. We always say it like that, because if the average telling you that wave height is 10 meters, it doesn't mean that the maximum possible height of the wave is 10 meters. So if in the forecast you are getting uh, written 10 meters of waves are expected or are observed, this means it's just one third of them are measured like that, and that's the average. If you see average, then this means that some of the waves will be bigger than the average. So if in the forecast it stays 10 meters, then some of the waves will be even 13 meters. Yeah. Now let's talk about the motion of waves. Progressive waves move forward across a surface. Movement of wave is not a movement of mass. That's a very important statement. But movement of energy or wave form. Wave form can sometimes can move pretty fast. So this uh, the crest and trough. They are moving, and sometimes they're even overtaking the ship, which is moving with 10 knots of speed. But imagine what would happen if water particles would move with 10 knots of speed. This means that you would have current of 10 knots, and it would be just impossible for you to sail. So remember this statement. It's a movement of the form, but water particle itself stays on its place, and it's making orbital movement up and down up and down let's repeat once again movement of wave is not a movement of mass but a movement of energy or wave form it's a form that moving not the water particle that is uh, moving forward if the water particle is moving forward then it's a mass transport mass transport is already current this type of progressive wave uh, motion causes circular or elliptical motion of particles at the surface and beneath the surface of the wave, which is again, it's orbital movement if it's a deep water or elliptical movement if it's a shallow water. Let's have a closer look on the picture with the wave motion. Here you can see wave length, so which is the distance between two crests. As the wave progressing forward, we can see the movement of water particle, which is making orbital movement. On this picture, it's counterclockwise. So this means that water particle remains more or less on the same place, but the form of the wave is moving into the general direction of progression of the waves. If the wind is very strong and it's able to blow away the water particle, it will break orbital movement of water particle, as you can see it here. 
Yeah? In this case, the distance to which the water particle was shifted is called mass transport. This means it will already create some current. Here as well you can see a term which is called wave base. Wave base usually is exactly half of the wavelength. So if the distance between two crests is 10 meters, then water base will be on 5 meters depth. This means that under wave base we don't have movement of water particles at all. Let's zoom this picture a little bit more and here you can see again wave base and this border is exactly on half of the wavelength depth. So you can see here that's the formula to calculate that. Uh, by the way question what will be the depth of the border of wave base if the wavelength is 12 meters? Exactly it's just 6 meters. Under this line, we don't see any orbital movements of water particles. And once again, you can repeat what is the mass movement. So, particle was shifted towards certain distance and uh, this distance will be called mass transport. So, to review, the wave base is the depth to which a surface wave can move water. Below the base, no more energy is imparted to the water particles. If ocean bottom is below the wave base, orbit remains circular and there is no energy felt by the ocean bottom. So if the water is deep enough, water motion will be more or less like that. If but if water depth is shallower than the wave base, then the orbits uh, of particles are squashed or more elliptical and become increasingly elliptical as you approach the bottom. So in effect, the water particle, which is trying to make it orbital movement, hits the bottom, reflects and jumps out. And on surface, you will start observe this kind of uh, breakers which you can see, for instance, uh, when you're walking on the beach in Aktau somewhere, you see that if you're looking far, then waves are looking nice like that. Yeah, nice crests, nice troughs, but once wave is approaching closer to the shore, it starts breaking, it starts jumping out because orbital movement cannot happen. It's, it will be elliptical movement and there is interaction of water particle with the bottom. So uh, here is a comparison between wave motion in deep water versus wave motion in shallow water. Deep water, orbit of particles is circular. Diameter of circle is equal to the wave height and diameter of orbit increases as you approach the base of the wave. Below this, no more energy is felt. The wave base is about one half of the wavelength. In shallower water, the particles orbit are flattened circles or ellipses and become increasingly elliptical as you approach the sea floor. The motion of particles is more back and forth rather than up and down. I'm talking about areas with shallow water closer to the shore. You most probably saw that, that on the beach, the water is going forward and back, forward and back and become nearly back and forth on the ocean bottom. This can result in significant uh, disturbance of ocean sediments and resuspension of sediments into water column. This type of particle motion is found when the wave is in water that is shallower than one half of the wave length. So this means if your wave length is 10 meters, and water depth is shallower than half of it, which is 5 meters, so let's say the depth is 4 meters, then this kind of motion will start happening, which is uh, presented on the picture below. So it's more or less like a back and forth movement, elliptical circles, compared to the deep water where water particles have enough space to make nice uh, 
uh, rotations in orbital movement. There are three main types of waves defined by the water depth. It's a deep water wave, intermediate water wave, and shallow water wave. But uh, mostly we're going to use with you these two types, it's deep water and shallow water, the most extreme ones. And just keep in mind that uh, there is a hybrid type of waves, which is uh, intermediate one. In this slide, we have to present you as well a new term, which is called celerity. Celerity is the velocity or speed of the waveform and not of the water. So it's celerity is how fast is the form, the crest and shaft are moving along the, along the water surface, not the water particles. Because if we have mass transport, yeah, then it's already current. The speed of water particles will be called the current. But celerity is just how fast the wave is moving along the surface. Okay, keep this in mind, please. Now let's talk about the life history of waves because uh, they are getting created and they are also dying somewhere. Uh -huh. Remember, uh, fetch is the distance over which wind blow to generate waves. So it's an area of contact. The larger the fetch, then the greater is the energy imparted to the water and the higher the waves formed. In area of high winds, there is a typically seen a chaotic sea or a jumble of waveforms um, superimposed one on another. So we have smaller waves, bigger waves, intermediate waves, and they are moving all together. And this is, of course, looking very chaotic. This is owing to the inconsistent application of force by winds whose speed and direction are always slightly varying. From previous slides, from previous presentations, you know that when two different ear masses are contacting each other, we have chaotic directions of the wind. So it's never uh, homogeneous. And of course, if you have chaotic directions of the wind, then also wind, uh, also waves will be generated in different directions. So, um, and this is really chaos. Yeah? And of course, after this chaos, we have uh, separation of those waves because every wave in this chaos has its own speed and direction. Yeah, in, if some of the waves are faster, then they will overtake the waves which are slower. Yeah, and on the larger distance from the fetch area, we're going to observe more or less homogeneous uh, water surface, which usually is called as swell. The waves you observe at the surface are net result of wave interference or the momentary interaction of waves as they pass through one another. Wave interference can be constructive or destructive. From those words, you can understand that they are able to construct something. So for instance, two smaller waves can construct one bigger one or destructive. So for instance, two waves, waves can uh, cancel each other. Constructive wave interference, two or more waves whose waveforms line up perfectly, crest to crest, trough to trough, such that the resulting wave is the sum of the heights. So this is actually one of the reasons uh, for creation of uh, enormous big waves, or they also called freak waves. It's a sum of uh, three or more waves together. Destructive interference, two or more waves whose waveform line up out of phase with one another, such that the wave heights of the crest is one um, of one are cancelling out by uh, the shorter wave height of the other trough. More often, there is some intermediate situation between the two, resulting in a waveform that is very complex. When you are in the fetch area, the energy is not consistent and the waveforms produced Ha, uh, have a large variety of wavelengths, periods, and heights, and this will result in complex wave interference and very chaotic sea, which is also represented here on this picture. That's the fetch area, and you can see that uh, wave heights are uh, differing from each other. But then, after the fetch area, since all the waves have different properties, different height, different celerity, they will separate each other. So for instance, waves with higher celerity will overtake 
the ones which have lower similarity and you're gonna have nice and uh, uh, beautiful sea with uh, almost the same uh, wave uh, periods and lengths and uh, all the other parameters. This is a picture of ship trying to move through a chaotic sea. Uh, you are now in the area of the fetch where strong and variable winds are creating a complex waveform patterns for the surface waves. You can see they are looking different from each other. So if you have seen ever swell at sea, you, you, you know that it's very beautiful, nice forms. All the periods are the same. Here you can see it's a chaos because wind is uh, um, has such a property as gusts. Yeah, for instance, uh, it's blowing 50 knots, the average speed, but from time to time it's increasing to 20, 23 knots, etc. That's a just a basic illustrative example. Now, this complex waveform pattern does not persist away from the chaotic sea area. This is due to dispersion, which is the gradual separation of wave types based on their relative wavelengths and speeds. Yeah, by the speed, we mean here, of course, celerity. So to um, understand that, I will give you a very simple example. Imagine that you're going to take a lot of different cars in your hands. Some of them are very fast, strong. Some of them are very old and slow. So they all have different properties, different speeds, different height, size, etc. Take them in your hands, shuffle them, and let's say you have to uh, move them in one same direction. Of course, some period of time they will move together. But then, let's say after one hour, the faster cars will of course overtake all the slower cars and faster cars will start moving together. So this is separation because of the own properties of all the cars. Yeah. So in waves is almost the same. So we take in hands different waves with different parameters. We shuffle them, which is fetch area, chaotic sea. We show them and we get dispersion, which is separation of those, uh, gradual separation of those uh, waves according to their properties. A bone graph shows a fetch area with chaotic seas. Once outside the fetch area, the waveform patterns become more organized into swells as the longer wavelength waves outrun uh, the, the waves which have uh, smaller parameters, which are slower. And uh, eventually the waves in this area outside the fetch would become shorter and shorter as the slower waves move through. So once again, fetch area, chaotic sea, yeah, it's also can be seen on this slide. Yeah, all the waves have different sizes, but then we, we observe very beautiful uh, ocean swell, which has more or less same periods and, uh, um, and in general, all the, all the other wave parameters. But here we can also observe on the picture below uh, the depth of the wave, because after some period of time, of course, the energy will get transmitted towards the shorelines and uh, that's the area where we're going to get breakers. Breaker, it's from the word to break. So this means that the wave breaks, it loses its energy and then disappears. On these two beautiful pictures, you can compare chaotic sea and swell. Yeah, you see swell is more or less organized. We have almost same distances be between uh, crests everywhere and here it's absolute chaos. Everything is chaotic. So, theoretically, from this picture, we can also make an important conclusion that swell is a, a residue of chaotic sea. Do you remember in previous slides, I have been talking about constructive interference and freak waves. So that's the when two smaller waves can sum up and form bigger one. So this picture is perfectly illustrating my words. You see that in general, the water surface is more or less flat, but then we observe this freak huge wave out of nowhere. It is a result of constructive interference. Here is another example of giant wave as a result of constructive interference. Those waves, of course, possessing a lot of danger because uh, when you're sailing at sea, you expect that uh, all of the waves will be more or less the same because uh, um, in the forecast, we see the average, 
but then out of nowhere comes something which is uh, twice bigger than the average and uh, imagine if you would have some persons uh, on deck yeah it would be quite quite uh, dangerous for shallow water waves we have very simple formula which is here this means if the depth of the water is 20 times less than the wave length then you're going to observe shallow water waves and uh, the main difference from deep water waves as it was also discussed in previous slides is back and forth movement and also um, in shallow water wave length will decrease so this means that two crests will come closer to each other and height will grow because because of the interaction with sea bottom and of course this interaction will create breaking waves because after reflecting from the bottom they have no way but to jump out of the water and break and this is how wave is dying to review if the wave speed decreases wave length will decrease as well but wave height will grow period that's the only property of the wave that will remain the same it's never changed period is a fundamental property of the wave now let's look at the form of the wave from above as it approaches the land due to the decrease in wave celerity as the wave moves into shallow water we know from the previous slide that in shallow waters uh, celerity will decrease but the height of the wave will increase yeah it's happening because bathymetry is not equal everywhere uh, bathymetry means that uh, depth everywhere is different yeah because sea bottom is different sometimes we have deep uh, parts sometimes we have uh, shallower parts sometimes we have banks just like it's illustrated uh, on the picture below uh, everywhere around this bank we have depth of 200 meters but on this bank depth is 40 meters of course it will have direct impact on the waves approaching from deep water because they will start interacting with shallow water it will grow up yeah and uh, it will also result in creation of breakers so this is very important information especially when you are seafarer if your course is lying like that you have to expect that when you will approach this bank you're gonna sail in area with higher waves so for you maybe then it's smarter to put your course in the deep water but if the weather is fine if you don't observe big waves then uh, also process um, uh, moving above the bank will be also safe for your ship but keep in mind banks and depth they will have direct impact on the height of the waves and height of the waves has direct impact on the safety of the ship how do waves break uh, to understand that we first have to take a look on this definition on the ratio of wave height divided by wave length hotel divided on lima in shallow water wave height increases and wave length decreases periods remains the same so when this ratio becomes larger than 1 divided on 7 or equals to 1 divided on 7 wave becomes unstable and breaks and there are three main types of breaker which you have to remember the first one is spilling breaker second one is plunging breaker and third one is surging breaker here again we have two extreme examples which are spilling breaker and surging breaker and one hybrid example which is plunging breaker so if you understand spilling breaker and surging breaker you can easily explain also the plunging breaker difference of breakers is directly dependent on type of the bottom so if we have flat bottom you're gonna observe spilling breaker when top of the wave crest spills over the wave energy released gradually across entire surf zone if you have very steep bottom then it's a surging breaker and the important property of surging breaker is that it actually never breaks as it never attains critical wave steepness which is coming from the previous formula and storm surge it sounds pretty dangerous and it is indeed dangerous natural phenomenon 
according to definition, is the rise in sea level resulting from low atmospheric pressure and accumulation of water driven shorewards by storm winds. So if there is a strong wind generated by low atmospheric pressure, we know that in northern hemisphere wind is uh, circulating around the low, low pressure counterclockwise. So if the strong wind is staying there for a longer period of time uh, and it's yeah, very strong, it's able to blow water towards the shore. And the longer is the period of the fetch, the longer is, uh, the higher is the speed of the wind, the bigger distance water is able to uh, cover on the shore. And of course, it brings some disasters because imagine the swell and the uh, chaotic sea will appear suddenly on shore. The water will be there where it's not supposed to be. And also it's bringing salt on the shore, meaning that the soil is getting spoiled. So this kind of storm surges are happening uh, sometimes uh, in uh, North Sea. The most famous one happened uh, around 70 years ago. I will show you more precise data in the next slides. And if besides low atmospheric pressure and strong winds in the area we have at the same time uh, spring tide, which is very high, the bulk of water will get easily blowing towards the shore. So in this in this case, the bulk of water generated by uh, attracting attraction forces from moon and sun will look like sail. And if there is a strong wind, of course, for, for the strong wind, it's much easier to push the bulk of water than, than just a flat surface. Yeah. If those factors are summing up, we get disaster. Of course, that's not happening like every year, maybe once in 50 years, but it's happening. After this lecture, you can also Google the most uh, uh, severe storm surges in uh, history of humanity. Here is a good historical example from 1900. A hurricane and storm surge. So they both combined just uh, brought an enormous amount of, of water on the shore. And uh, you see that uh, cities, villages were just vanished. Yeah, the, the, and since you know that water is behaving a bit different in uh, when it's shallow there, it's just a, a movement in horizontal line. Yeah, so this means that if the water is approaching on shore, it's also returning back and taking people, animals, uh, whatever. The cars were not existing at that time, but uh, yeah, everything what was needed for, for, for people to live was just taken into the water. Another disaster created by strong wind, 1969. Hurricane Camille. So you see that the ship is on shore. It's not the place where the ship's supposed to be. So the water level rise, wind was blowing very strong, and suddenly all the ships appeared on the shore. Yeah, of course, it's a disaster for the ports, it's a big problem for fishing industry, for all the industries which are related to, to the ships. Yeah, and you can see how powerful wind can be. In this slide, I will explain you basic principles of Saichi's, Saichi or standing wave. You can see we have uh, closed and open basins. So the top example is uh, closed basin. So we, let's say it's a lake. So if the wind is blowing from the right side to the left, then that's the area where we're gonna observe wave. But this wave will stay here for some period of time because wind will hold this amount of water closer to the shore. Of course, after some period of time, yeah, since it's a wave, it has periods, it will decrease, yeah, but then it will return back. It's just like um, uh, when you drink tea and you start uh, yeah, shaking your cup, you will observe also kind of side cheese, but uh, in your cup it will, yeah, it will, for uh, the standing wave will appear just for a few seconds. Yeah, but uh, when we are talking about bigger water reservoirs, of course, the wave staying there for much longer times. Here we have also another definition, which is anti-node and node. Node, that's the area um, of water where the water level is not changing. It's kind of axis for the standing wave. Anti-node, those are extremum points. 
the maximum water level, which is uh, the, the, the maximum crest height of the, of the uh, Saichi. And some more information you have to know about Saichi's is that the period of Saichi is controlled by um, geometry of the basin. So which means if you have um, very long and uh, narrow bay, of course, the period of the wave and the height of the wave will be much higher in this case. So the good example for that is Bautina Bay, which is uh, approximately 120 kilometers to the north from Aktau. Yeah, so the form of the bay is like that. Yeah, that's the bay. And if the wind is blowing inside the bay, it's able to push enormous amount of water inside the bay. And of course, for some period of time, at the end of the bay where most of the ships are located in, in Bautina, you will observe high, high, uh, very high level of water. Yeah, that's the side chain. Of course, sometimes it can happen vice versa that wind is blowing water out of the bay. And this is also quite problematic because uh, Bautina Bay is just five meters deep. That's the average depth there. And if the wind force is too strong and we have southerly wind, then, uh, then the, the depth there can decrease uh, up to 3.5 meters. So this is uh, from what I saw with my own eyes. So you have to be careful with that and always take this phenomena into account when you navigate. It's not only about tides, also take into account side cheese. Internal waves. Uh, here you can read uh, pretty um, difficult explanations. I will try to explain it very simple. So if you're going to take two liquids with big difference in density, let's say it's uh, cooking oil and water, and put them together in one glass, of course they will not mix. You're going to see a layer that's splitting those two liquids. So this layer between two liquids is able to move. And this is internal wave. Of course, uh, in water, when we are talking about oceans or lakes, uh, you will not see this kind of uh, extreme difference in densities. There is a slight difference between because of the temperature and difference in salinity. But there in the oceans, we also have those internal waves, which you cannot see with your own eyes. They are very deep. If you are talking about the ocean, they can be even 5,000 meters or six kilometers deep. Um, yeah, just nice to know that this kind of things are existing. On this picture, you can see nice illustration of internal wave. And here also most probably it's a um, definition, it's a term that you see first time in your life. It's a picnoc line. Picnoc line is the line which is uh, splitting two uh, liquids with different properties. It's just like Terminator. If you remember it from celestial navigation, Terminator is a line that's uh, dividing day and night. So Picnoc line is a line, it's imaginary line, which is splitting or uh, yeah, like a border between uh, two liquids with different properties. And here you can see where the line is. Yeah. In terms of navigation, this phenomenon is interesting because sometimes your echo sounder might reflect, the signal from echo sounder might reflect from the picnoc line because of the difference in densities and you will see fake depth. Tsunamis are not appearing that often as normal waves, which we see most of the time uh, at sea, like uh, swell or chop. And it's good because uh, all the time tsunamis are related in the news to um, thousands of deaths, disasters, uh, like uh, uh, Fukushima. Yeah, tsunamis uh, are happening because of the earthquakes, submarine landslides, and uh, underwater explosions. Of course, the main source is the earthquake. So how it's happening, it's uh, the same, just like with simple waves. Earthquake forces water particles to rotate in uh, orbital movement. And the problem is when this orbital movement moves towards the shore to shallow waters. And in shallow waters, we observe breaking of the water. So the orbital movement hits the bottom. There is interaction between water particle and the bottom. Orbital movement becomes elliptical movement and everything that the breaker is jumping on the shore, killing and killing uh, 
people, vanishing cities, etc. In this picture, you can see how tsunami is getting generated. We see that land here is moving up and down movement, and this generates a wave with very big period. By the way, at sea, in deep water, tsunami is not dangerous. It will not kill your ship. There's only problem when this wave will go on shore. Here you can see that for tsunami, because of its properties, because of the length of the wave, it's not a big problem to cover huge distances. So in this example, we see how tsunami covered easily distance between Panama and Japan. And this makes those waves, of course, extremely dangerous. People, of course, know that tsunamis are possessing uh, very big dangers for uh, people living closer to the shore. There are plenty, a lot of advanced systems which are able to predict appearance of tsunami. People getting uh, messages on their phones. Uh, there are special voice messages, uh, sound messages in the cities. Uh, and uh, yeah, people have enough time to leave. And uh, most of the time, people are getting killed, not by the first wave, but with the second wave. Because uh, after first wave approaches the shore, people want to see what happened to their home, they return back, and then the second wave is coming. And there is a big time difference between first and second wave. Of course, it's not only two waves, it's much more coming. Yeah, but uh, the second wave will come and it didn't, will have uh, still enough energy to wash everything away. Once the water is coming onshore, of course, it will not stay there forever. It will return back. And when it's returning back, it's also taking uh, all the stuff from shore back to the sea. And some of the people are just getting missed forever.